So pretty much every time we start a lecture here, we start off talking about how there's three types of quantity we keep track of in physics, three fundamental types. There's length slash space, there's mass, and there's time. And I'm saying how like, for the most part, you know, length, distance, space is the simplest one. But there's another way in which it's really not the simplest, right? Because time is just time. We're not going to be dealing with relativity in this series. And even when you do deal with relativity, there's still just one dimension of time. And also, mass is a kind of a complicated concept, but there's just the mass. There's no such thing as one type of mass versus another type of mass. Versus with space, well, there's more than one direction of space, right? There's, you know, left to right, up to down, and forwards and backwards. And of course, none of those directions is special, but no matter where you are or which direction you pick, you can always pick two other directions that are perpendicular to it, right? You know, you don't have to do like, you know, this way plus this way and this way, right? You know, you could do, you know, this diagonal as well as this diagonal and just make them perpendicular to each other. And you could even make this diagonal and this diagonal and then make the third one perpendicular uh, over some other axis. And no matter which way you look, there are three dimensions of space, right? And we're now going to at least discuss how to do things in two dimensions. And extending things into three dimensions is not much more difficult. And we'll introduce that gradually. But today we're going to go through the techniques for analyzing things in two dimensions. Right? Because, recall, I mentioned last time that we're going to start thinking a little bit about vectors. Right? Because they're, you know... When you have a distance, you need to also specify, you know, a distance in which direction, right? So if you have 10 meters, it could be 10 meters straight up, it could be 10 meters to the right, um, you know, or it could be 10 meters at an angle of 30 degrees off the horizontal, or 10 meters at an angle of 45 degrees off the horizontal, uh, you know. And all you need to do is just remember your trigonometry, right? a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and angle is equal to the arc tangent of opposite over adjacent. And then you can also remember that uh, if you have uh, the hypotenuse, AKA the, the magnitude of uh, one of these vectors, uh, then you can get the components by using sine and cosine. And well, previously we've been thinking about this one dimensional example of something just falling right? And we were analyzing that using what we call the kinematics equations. So, yeah, pull those up here. So we developed this, this set of equations that describes an object with a constant acceleration. And a constant acceleration includes the possibility of constant and equal to zero, in which case something just moves in a straight line, right? And so previously we analyzed two sets of data, one showing an object falling at a uniform acceleration, just like taking this tennis ball and dropping it, or also if I throw it up in the air and let it come back down in a straight line, that's also a uniform acceleration. It's just a uniform acceleration where it starts out going up, accelerates further and further down until it stops or, you know, it receives a negative acceleration with positive velocity until the velocity is zero, and then it continues to receive a negative acceleration. It's always constant and negative, and then eventually it starts going back down. Uh, but we also analyzed a situation where it just has a constant velocity, right? Um, you know, where, you know, I was just driving at approximately constant 40 miles an hour in a straight line. And so we're now going to sort of go through the simplest exercise you could of just combining those two things. Which, incidentally, this is uh, now beginning to uh, tie back, because I always want to tie back to Zeno's paradox and this notion of 
uh, are space and time continuous or discrete? And one reason that we are pretty confident that space is continuous and not discrete is that uh, if, it, if, it, if there was something like a pixels for the universe, right? If it was like this graph paper where you can see individual squares, uh, then space would not be what we call isotropic, right? If there was unique, you know, like there's a direction that the that these lines run along, right? Um, and so if I tilt it 45 degrees, then the, the lines, you know, are still perpendicular to each other, but they're in unique directions. And remember I was saying that, uh, you know, as far as we can tell with every experiment we've ever done and also every just basic intuitive experience people have ever had um you know there's no special direction in the universe there's up and down relative to the surface of the earth but up down um you know here is the opposite of up down on the other side of the earth uh, which i guess is in the middle of the indian ocean because i live in the west coast of the united states at uh, and if if there were some sort of pixel size of the universe, then there would have to be a you know vertical and horizontal axis where the pixels are arrayed, and we would be able to find those axis lines. So it could still be that there's some discrete discreteness to space if you look small enough, but it would have to be something very strange where it's not just in a nice orderly grid like that. Uh, otherwise, we would be able to you know we wouldn't necessarily be able to see the individual. Uh, spacing, but we would be able to tell uh, when we were looking perfectly along a uh, grid line versus, you know, some angle to it, and we don't see that. So, now, what about combining those motions? Well, if I combine, you know, something moving up and down, but with force of gravity, the tennis ball, with just moving along horizontally at a constant speed, well, what do I get? That, you know, very straightforwardly. It's kind of unremarkable in a lot of ways, but we want to analyze it properly so we can start doing more interesting things. Because, you know, the real world exists in three dimensions, and we're going to be still analyzing the trajectories in two and three dimensions of things that we just considered to be point-like objects, even though they actually have some size to them, but we still just treat them like one thing that has one position, right? But you could always think, you know, do you want the left side of the tennis ball, the right side, the top, the bottom, the front, the back, you know? Or do you want the just the center, which is basically what we're thinking about, is, you know, just imagine the entire tennis ball was just one little tiny thing that existed only at the exact center instead of uh, having some extent to it. Uh, because eventually we are going to want to start thinking, right, about, you know... Um, like, well, areas, right? You know, because, you know, you combine, I guess this, this paper has markings all over it, but, you know, you combine, um, you know, two dimensions of space, and you, instead of a distance, you get an area, you combine three dimensions of space, you get a volume, and we're eventually going to want to think about those things, too. But for now, let's just think about some one, one object moving in two dimensions, right? So, like I said, we can consider an object moving in a straight line at a constant speed. So this is the, or it's not actually moving in a straight line in, anymore, sorry. But we can consider an object moving at a constant velocity in the x-axis, right? So horizontally, just moving at a constant speed. And that the x as a function of, at horizontal position as a function of time just looks like a straight line uh, versus y as a function of time just like when I throw it straight up and down it looks you know like this parabola uh, and if we can combine those two things together we have x as a function of time and y as a function of time we can get y as a function of x uh, and then we can label each position of time uh, and it still has the, the graph still has the same shape it's just you know sort of a little bit you know the aspect ratio is different it's a little bit steeper but it's still just a parabola, right? Because if, you know, x is just linearly proportional with time, then you can just kind of think of, you know, x, y as a function of x is just a, you know, squished first or squished or stretched, uh, squeezed or stretched, sorry, uh, parabola along its, the horizontal graph axis. Uh, so as usual, I have some data uh, that uh, we're going to analyze where I just throw a tennis ball like this and we use the fancy schmancy computer vision software to track it again although also going to be, as usual, going over how to do it by hand. Yep, that's me. Or more accurately, my hand. I'll bet you're wondering how I got in this situation. Well, 
I stood just outside of the camera's field of view. But the reason is so that we can track the trajectory of the tennis ball through space over a wider range. And so to do that, we're going to use our old friend, the Open Computer Vision Library, which is available for Python and C++. And you don't need to know how to use it. As usual, I'll be using it to add some augmentations to the video so that you can analyze things by hand. And first off, let's just see what the trajectory of the tennis ball looks like. So that's pretty straightforward. I just toss the tennis ball up in the air and a little bit out away from me, and it follows some path through space and time. <laughs> so now let's use OpenCV to look at the trajectory. And what we're basically going to look at is the blue line you'll see is a history of where the tennis ball has been, at least according to the object tracker in OpenCV. And that's essentially showing us y as a function of x, right? It's showing us the trajectory through space. And since the vertical on the frame is y and the horizontal is x, that's y as a function of x. And we can also extract each of those, both y and x, as a function of time by looking at the timestamp on the frame number. And so here we go. Now finally, I'm just going to add some grid lines on here every 10 centimeters in both X and Y, as well as you can see the timestamp is at the top, just like usual, so that it is possible to analyze this segment uh, without needing to ha know how to use OpenCV. Okay, so now here we are looking at individual frames again, and this is what we're defining as time equal to zero. Because remember, we always just define some starting point in time. Everything before that is negative time, which is just the time before the arbitrary start. And then we measure time after that start point. So this is t equals to zero, which is just, uh, like I think, one or maybe two frames after the tennis ball has left my hand. And so now let's look at the trajectory as a function of time. and after a couple of frames, it starts that tracking where it, well, it starts tracking immediately, but after a couple of frames, it starts drawing the history of where the tennis ball has been. And as we go every 50 milliseconds and start to see that shape of a parabola forming, and well, we can also look at the timestamps and get an explicit curve like this showing us y is a function of time and x is a function of time. And like usual, we can ask the computer to give us an equation that best fits this data. And you can do this by hand without too much difficulty. And for the uh, x component, because it's just a straight line, doing it for y is more challenging. And you could do one of two things. You could either just trust the computer and understanding how it does it is not terribly complicated. I think I might do yet another little lecture in the data tutorial series where I actually explain how the computer finds these fits. Because again, it's a really, really useful skill to have um, if you want to be any sort of scientist, engineer. Um, and if you want to go into anything like data science or machine learning, that's absolutely critical. That's their, their bread and butter, uh, knowing how to take some data and uh, fit some mathematical model to it. And so, but anyways, the computer gives us a model for this, which is that the uh, acceleration is uh, 9.2, so one half of that, one half, because it's one half at squared, is 4.6 times time squared plus 3.5 times time, which is our uh, initial velocity, the y component, the vertical component of our initial velocity. And then we also just have some non-zero starting height because uh, here we're, you know, positive is up, negative is down, but we're defining zero as the uh, top of this measuring tape where the rafter is in the living room here. And so then we have to add uh, negative 1.5 meters because it starts 1.5 meters from the top. And likewise for X, the model it gives us is 
the the initial x velocity is 2 meters per second and the initial x offset is 0 0.4 meters which is just measured from the left side of the frame uh, roughly where I'm standing uh, because it it starts with my hand sort of swinging out right and you know it doesn't quite start uh, right at the edge uh, so uh, I guess so all right so what can we do with this well, a few things. One is we can ask some questions about that initial velocity, right? The computer tells us uh, how fast it's going in the horizontal, and it's just a constant, right? Because there's no, going back to F equals MA that we learned about, there's no forces, therefore there's no accelerations, therefore velocity and speed are just constants. And in Y, the only force that's acting, at least the only force that we're modeling, is gravity, which is just a constant you know, 9.8, or in this case, we're getting a little bit less than that because it's not really the only force acting. We'll get into that another time. But to a decent approximation, uh, we're getting 9.2 instead of 9.8, which is a little bit off, but uh, it's acceptable for our purposes. So then, well, what about the initial velocity, right? It, we have some initial velo initial velocity in y, and because we have an acceleration, it's changing. And we have some initial velocity in x that doesn't change. Um, so that implies, like I was saying, we have magnitude and direction, two dimensions, um, a vector. And we can ask questions about that initial velocity vector, right? We know the x component, which is 2 meters per second, and we know the y component, which is 3.5 meters per second, uh, which we can always just get from these 10 centimeter grid lines in, instead of from the computer vision algorithm. Well, the grid lines plus looking where the bright yellow green object is. And well, we can ask what was the magnitude of the initial velocity? How fast in total did I throw it? Uh, a whopping four meters per second, which uh, if you're wondering, uh, one meter per second is pretty close to two miles an hour and it's about 3.5 kilometers per hour so I actually did not throw it particularly fast because I wanted it to all stay inside of the field of view of the camera uh, and I we can also ask what angle I threw it at uh, so I threw it up at uh, 60 degrees relative to the horizontal right because the arc tangent of 3.5 over 2 is 60 degrees all right that's pretty nifty um, we can also ask a couple little questions about, you know, given, given that we know that it was going upwards initially at 3.5 meters per second, uh, it should take approximately 3.5 meters per second divided by 9.8 meters per second, se per second uh, the acceleration of gravity, uh, nominally to reach 0 0.35, which to reach the point where it has zero velocity, which is 0 0.35 seconds. Uh, and that actually lines up pretty well with our data. So this is based on the assumption of uh, gravity as the given value of 9.8 instead of what we actually uh, determined from fitting our data. But it's in fairly good agreement. You can see it actually maybe a little bit to the, to the right there for our curve. But overall, pretty decent. Okay, so that lets us understand this simple trajectory, at least to some degree. But can we maybe do something else with that? Well, we can do a couple things, right? One is, like I said, we can plug in, um, we can plug in the fact that we know x as a function of time, so therefore we could invert that algebraically and determine time as a function of x or t is equal to some expression of x, plug that back into y of t, right? Just plug in this equation for t, and then that gives us another algebraic equation for y as a function of x, which can be useful if we want to be able to predict that trajectory through space. Because remember, I was saying before that uh, we want to be able to uh, we want to be able to extrapolate, right? That's the that's the power of physics is that we want the ability to uh, you know, determine what's going on at times when we don't necessarily have the ability to uh, have data points. Uh, and also we want to be able to extrapolate out to areas where we don't have data points, uh, possibly because they're in the future. Uh, and, you know, physics, you know, originated trying to make predictions about the future. I mean, uh, 
without getting into the history of Isaac Newton and his uh, bizarre philosophies, you know, but, uh, you know, physics, as we know it, started out coming up with a, as coming up with a more accurate theory for the motion of the planets in the sky, because, uh, you know, the motion of the stars is very predictable. It's just, you know, they go around the sky once every 24 hours, and they also, every 365 days, uh, go, you know, into a slightly into a you know one extra revolution so that you know uh, every 365 days so that you know in december and in january we're looking in opposite or sorry in december and uh, july we're looking in uh, opposite directions uh, but the planets move relative to the stars right and people want it, it it's very easy to predict the star where the stars will be because this on the same day at the same time every year uh, the stars will be in the same place but the planets will not people wanted a theory of where the planets would be uh, so they could predict where they would be in the future. Uh, why they were so concerned with this is a kind of interesting philosophical and historical tangent that I won't get into, but history of uh, astronomy and astrology are uh, deeply interwoven in a lot of ways. And, but we want to be able to predict some things about the future. Um, so now that we have this theory of two-dimensional motion, uh, we can make predictions in one dimension, right? The simplest prediction might be if you know your car can drive at some maximum speed and you know how far you have to drive, you can just say distance divided by speed is equal to time and infer how long it will take for you to drive there or walk there or bike there or anything. Although, of course, it's easier to predict the speed of a car in a lot of ways because uh, it's just determined by not getting a speeding ticket instead of uh, how fast you can bike depends on uh, how much energy you have as does how fast you can walk. And uh, then, well, how far could we throw something though? Uh, well, uh, you know, we know it's going to follow this ballistic arc, uh, but we want to basically ask uh, when is y equals to zero uh, or, you know, equal to some whatever whatever the whatever the y distance of the ground is like i was saying in uh, our example y, you know y, the ground is actually uh like minus two meters or something or a little more than yeah it's the, the ground is minus 1.9 meters um in the sort of arbitrary coordinate system i defined um that was based on reusing code from last time actually even though the frame size is different um uh, but it helps illustrate the point that you can define any zero you want uh, as long as you keep track of it within the same problem. And so we know that, you know, the change in x is just going to be equal to x velocity times time. So uh, in that sense, determining how far we can throw a ball is easy. It's just how fast we throw it times how long it stays in the air. Uh, and that means we got to figure out how long it stays in the air. Well, to do that, we use the uh, equation for y, and we set it equal to zero, or to whatever the height of the ground is, and then we use our old friend from algebra, the quadratic formula, um, which if we happen to be uh, throwing it uh, and catching it at the same height, like I do here, uh, then we can actually, this simplifies down to just t is equal to 2 times uh, the initial velocity in y divided by the force of gravity. Uh, in the example uh, of that I was throwing it, it I, I start throwing it from you know, shoulder height, uh, but it lands all the way on the ground. Uh, so, you know, the starting height and the ending height are <laughs> are different in that case, uh, which complicates things a little bit, uh, but not, it, it doesn't require us to use any different equations. It just means there's fewer things we can set equal to zero. And so that calculation, uh, show real quick right here, is uh, just, well, minus 1.9 meters, which is the ground relative to what I defined as zero and y, which is not quite the top of the measuring stick, but it's the the same pixel where the top was in a previous example, which is a bad zero, a bad kind of a bad zero point, but it illustrates that it doesn't matter where your zero point is as long as you keep track of it. So then the ground is minus 1.9 meters, the starting height is minus 1.5 meters, and that's the crucial thing is that uh, we're measuring where the ground is and where the starting position is in the same coordinate system, and then we want to say we well and then we know that it starts going positive 3.5 meters per second and it's we know it's accelerating at minus 4.6 meters per second squared uh, and we can you know again use the quadratic formula to just solve and get it hits the ground at uh, 0.86 seconds which uh, if you look at the graph is indeed uh, where it ends because it I mean it, I cut off the uh, automatic 
thing when it hits hits the ground. Uh, or I could extend it, uh, which I guess I'll do, and then you can see it, you know, bounces onto the ground, uh, but it's at 0 0.86 seconds when it hits the ground. So hold on though, you might feel like something about that looks a little bit funky, and it's that it doesn't hit the ground until around 1.1 seconds here, which is much longer than 0.86 seconds. So what happened? Well, I made a mistake. And 0.86 seconds is just how long it takes until I arbitrarily decided to cut off the computer vision algorithm. And it's how long it takes it to fall by, you know, what is this, down to like minus 1.9 meters, which is not really the ground. <laughs> it's a perfectly valid question to ask, how far will the ball travel and how long will it take to arrive at minus 1.9 meters, but uh, that's not where the ground is. Uh, the ground is actually at minus 2.9 meters, and so it doesn't arrive there until, well, 1.1 second. So just substitute in 2.9 everywhere there's 1.9 and everything works out uh, with the same equations, but of course you get an answer that's, um, you know, much more physically meaningful. Not that the previous answer has no physical reality to it, it's just, it's the time that the ball arrives at some arbitrary height that we probably don't care about instead of what we really care about, which is, you know, when it hits the ground. So, oopsies. So, this was fortunately, I think, uh, a little bit shorter. Um, Next time, we're going to be getting into free body diagrams like this one. Uh, we went over this one last time. It's kind of the simplest free body diagram you could have where there's only one force, which is the force of gravity pulling the object down. And, um, you know, because we've been talking about uh, Newton's laws and F equals MA, um, but we basically just immediately turned that into the kinematics equations where force is a constant, therefore acceleration is a constant. Uh, but next time we'll start talking about how do we analyze how forces actually act on objects and how we can start thinking about that a little more carefully. Uh, also, since I am using the OpenCV library so much, I'll probably do a mini tutorial on how to do that. Um, you really don't need to know how to. And to be honest, I'm not a super expert on OpenCV, although I do have a working knowledge of how to use it. Uh, so by no means will it be, you know, a super deep dive into how to use OpenCV, but I'll show you how to run the scripts that uh, I use to uh, track the object trajectories. And uh, I also think that uh, it's, I should probably go ahead and also start doing uh, problem sessions to go with these because we've now developed enough equations that I can start writing out some practice problems uh, and I'll do an example of solving those. So. Uh, I'll hopefully get around to that next week, but uh, schedule for this is fairly sporadic, which is mostly fine because, well, uh, you know, this is a supplement to any other sort of materials you might be using, uh, so yeah, mostly works out fine, I think, but uh, yeah, bye.